I never imagined, even in my darkest nightmares, that I would come face to face with a terror so real that it would shatter everything I believed to be true. I used to think these horrors were nothing more than tales spun to frighten children into obedience, to keep them safe in the comfort of their beds. But now I realize how wrong I was. These stories were dire warnings, outlining rules that should never be broken. They are the only barrier between us and the horrors lurking beyond the edge of the ordinary. Break them even once, and safety becomes a distant memory, replaced by a darkness that knows no mercy. I received a phone call that irreversibly changed my life. The voice on the other end, cold and clinical, delivered the tragic news. My parents were presumed to be dead. Traces of their blood had been found in the home I grew up in. The officer's words barely registered. Something about a freak animal attack. Something rare. The police shared the horrific details with me. And now, I'll share them with you. I was told the house was a war zone. Furniture overturned and blood splattered across the walls and ceiling. Whatever happened, it was clear they tried to put up a fight. But here's the most chilling part. Their bodies, sadly, were never found. I had to bury empty caskets, haunted by the terrifying question of what really happened in that house. I can't help but wonder if they felt pain in those final, horrific moments. I cling to the hope that the shock and adrenaline dulled their agony, numbing them like slipping into a dream or falling into a deep sleep. It's a small comfort. My parents' farmhouse sits on the desolate outskirts of an old, forgotten town, isolated in the middle of nowhere. The closest trace of civilization is miles away, and the only way to reach them is by navigating a lonely dirt road that snakes through the wilderness. Three sides of the house is surrounded by thick woods. In front stretches a vast cornfield. It's been there since I was a kid, a looming presence that always unsettled me even in daylight. As a child, I would imagine the overgrown stalks hiding dark secrets. Secrets I never dared or had the balls to go investigate. Every time I passed by, I couldn't shake the feeling that something alive was watching me, waiting for the moment I would finally venture too close. Out there, across the cornfield, stands just one other house. It belongs to my only neighbor and family friend an old man we called Big Bob. He never had a wife, never any kids, just him. I remember Big Bob always lived alone, a gentle giant whose size seemed almost too large for this world. He spent his days on his weathered porch, sitting on a rocking chair that creaked under his weight, the wood straining with each slow, rhythmic motion, rocking backwards and forwards. My parents had a good relationship with him, they often worked side by side in the fields, harvesting corn together. On the weekends, my dad and Big Bob would head into the woods, hunting for hours. But no matter how deep they ventured, they always made sure to return before nightfall. Now that I think about it, my parents had a peculiar unease about the dark, a wariness that went beyond simple caution. As a child, I wasn't allowed outside once it got dark, especially near the cornfield. They claimed it was to keep me from getting lost in the towering stalks, or to protect me from a bear or mountain lion that might wander too close. But deep down, I always sensed there was something more, something they never spoke about. When I was old enough, I left my parents' house to go to college. Ten years have passed since then, and I never once returned. Instead, my parents made the trip to visit me in the city once a year. I think they enjoyed the change of scenery, a brief escape from the quiet of the farm. Now I find myself heading back, not out of choice, but out of duty. With no siblings to share the burden, it falls on me to handle the grim task of sorting through what remains of my parents' lives. The house, the land, it's all mine now, by default. I've inherited the old place. 
I don't have to deal with the messy situation of arguing with siblings over inheritance. I've heard it said, death and money make people turn funny. And I'm grateful I won't have to find out just how true that is. By driving in, I managed to reach the farm just before dark. As I passed by Big Bob's old house, I wasn't surprised to see him on his porch, sitting on that familiar rocking chair, a pipe nestled between his teeth. His sidearm and bowie knife hung from his belt, always present and ready. I could see him smiling as I brought the car to a stop in front of his house. If I didn't know the guy, I'd have been terrified of him. He reminded me of Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the kind of guy you wouldn't want to cross paths with on a deserted road. I got out of my car, the door closing with a solid thud behind me, and made my way up the creaking steps to his porch. Big Bob didn't rise, he never did, but he extended his hand in greeting. His grip was strong, his rough, calloused hand easily swallowing mine as we shook. I'm sorry for your loss, son. It's a damn shame what happened to your parents. They were good people. I nodded in agreement, and asked if he knew anything more than what the police had revealed. Big Bob's gaze grew distant as he took a deep drag from his pipe, the smoke curling around him as he took a thoughtful pause. You might not remember, but the whole town has always believed these woods to be cursed. That's why no one else lives out here except us. We're the only ones desperate enough to settle in this forsaken place. The soil was good, so we took the gamble. It seems your parents... Well, they just lost the bet. I asked him what he meant by the town being cursed. It struck me as an odd, almost irrational thing to say. But then again, living out here in such isolation might drive anyone to superstitious beliefs. I'm just an old man rambling. Don't pay me any mind. But if you're staying here for a while, it would do you good to remember the rules your parents had. You do remember them, don't you? Never go out after dark. There's all sorts of predators lurking, always on the hunt for easy prey. And make sure every door and window is locked tight. I turned and headed back toward the car. I opened the door, but just as I was about to get in, Big Bob's voice called out to me. One last thing. Don't go investigating any strange noises you hear at night. The animals out here can make all sorts of eerie sounds that might seem like something else. It's important. Don't break this rule. Promise me you won't. I nodded, slipping into the driver's seat, the door closing behind me. I remembered my parents' rules, but those were rules to keep a child in line, and I wasn't a child anymore. It was a shame the old man had lost his grip on reality out here, a man consumed by loneliness and superstition. As I drove the final few feet towards my parents' house, I contemplated over Big Bob's cryptic warning, animals make noises that might seem like something else. What did he mean? I found that a tad bit odd, weird shit to say the least. I parked the car in front of my parents' house. It was dark now making everything around me feel spooky and wrong. The cornfield to my left rustled in the wind, while to my right loomed the silhouette of my late parents' old house. Despite the eerie surroundings, the house looked normal and ordinary, as if it hadn't witnessed the brutal murder of my parents. I stepped out of the car and made my way up the creaking wooden steps of the porch. Keys in hand, I reached the front door. Oddly, there were no signs of forced entry, no shattered glass, no broken lock, nothing to suggest the horror that had unfolded here. I paused, the key slipping into the lock with a quiet click. My hand hesitated on the handle as I braced myself for whatever remnants of the crime might remain on the other side of the door. A brief inspection inside revealed that the authorities had done a thorough job cleaning up the place. Besides what remained of some bodily fluids that had stained the living room floor, I noticed a few scattered bullet holes in the walls. There was also a deep claw mark in the woodwork, evidence of some sort of animal attack. Yet, disturbingly, everything else appeared eerily normal, as if nothing had ever happened. 
Upstairs, I found my old bedroom exactly as I had left it all those years ago. The bed was perfectly made, the sheets taut, smooth, and untouched, as if the room had been frozen in time. As I walked back down the stairs, I saw framed photos lining the walls of my parents and me smiling, frozen in moments of joy, unaware that our time together was ticking away. My heart ached with the weight of those memories, and so I decided to head outside, hoping the cool night air might ease the ache inside me. Outside, I stood on the porch, staring into the night. My gaze fixed on the cornfield, just 20 feet away, its dark outline barely visible in the weak glow of the porch light. I watched it in silence, desperate for any distraction from the dark thoughts of my mind. At that moment, I heard a strange sound from the cornfield, just beyond the porch light. It was faint, almost like someone speaking, but the words were muffled, like distant mumbling. Curiosity pulled me forward, and I stepped off the porch. I edged closer to the field, the sound growing no clearer. That's when I saw it, a few stalks of corn swaying unnaturally, as if something was moving within, hidden just beyond my sight. Who the fuck is out there? I called out, immediately regretting the words as they left my lips. For a moment, there was only silence. Then, something answered. A voice from the cornfield, twisted and wrong. Come closer, so I can show you. Every instinct screamed at me to run. I turned and bolted toward the house. Behind me, I heard it. Something large, crashing through the cornfield, snapping stalks as it came after me. The sound of its pursuit grew louder, closer. As I bolted up the porch steps, something heavy whizzed past me, crashing into the side of the house with a sickening thud. But I didn't dare look to see what it was. I hurled myself through the door, slamming it shut before it got to me. Whatever had chased me, I never saw it. I couldn't bring myself to look back as I ran, too terrified of what I might have seen behind me. With my back pressed against the door, I strained to listen, my heart pounding in my ears. But there was nothing, no footsteps, no rustling in the cornfield, just the familiar hum of insects in the night. When I finally mustered the courage, I cautiously peeked out the windows, but the darkness revealed nothing. I wasn't about to take any chances, so I went through the house, locking every door and window. Once I'd secured everything, I calmed down, my body heavy with exhaustion. Eventually, I went to bed. And even though the night passed without incident, I couldn't shake the feeling that something had been watching me through the windows. Worse yet, there was a smell, sickly, foul, like something rotting, worse than shit. It came and went in waves, filling my lungs with the stench of decay. But no matter how hard I looked, there was nothing, no source no cause. I woke early the next morning, determined to push the bizarre events of the previous night from my mind. I told myself it was just a bear or some other mundane explanation, denying and refusing to entertain any thoughts of the supernatural. I needed to drive into town to pick up some food. There wasn't any in the house, as I'd expected. Also, later that night, two of my college friends were coming over to keep me company, offering support after everything that had happened with my parents. I needed to grab food for them as well. As I made my way out, I remembered something had been thrown at me during my frantic escape from the cornfield. My mind raced back to the moment, and I retraced my steps to the spot where I'd heard the object strike the wall. Kneeling down, my heart sank as I saw what lay there. It was my dad's phone. I tried to power the phone on, but the battery was dead. Why was this thrown at me? Was it meant to send a message? Something personal? Something cruel? I clenched the phone in my fist. It felt like holding a piece of him, but it was tainted by whatever horror had taken him away. Unable to bear looking at it any longer, I went back inside and left it to charge, hoping it might reveal some clue whenever I could bear to look at it again. After, I headed to Big Bob's house. Maybe he'd know something. 
just as I expected, Bob was there, sitting in his usual spot on the porch. I offered to pick up anything he needed from town, knowing the trip was a long haul for someone his age. He nodded and asked for just a few basic items. Before I left for town, I finally gathered the courage to bring up what had happened near the cornfield the night before. I told him he should be careful, suggesting a bear or mountain lion might be prowling the area. Gripping his sidearm, his expression shifted, replaced by something more serious, as if he already knew something I didn't. Wait, this thing last night, did it speak to you? I froze, startled by Big Bob's question. His usual calm was gone. He stood up from his chair, his massive frame looming over me. Tell me, did you speak back to it? His voice was laced with concern, eyes searching mine for an answer. I swallowed hard, guilt tightening in my chest. Something told me I had done something terribly wrong, so I lied and said no. Bob exhaled, a heavy sigh of relief, but the tension never left his face. He sank back into his chair, his expression still clouded with doubt. My words had stirred something he wished had stayed buried. Without another word, I left Bob to his unsettling thoughts and got back into my car. The drive into town was refreshing. I stopped for breakfast at a cozy cafe, then wandered through a few bookshops. The welcoming scent of old books and comfortable seating in plush armchairs made me lose track of time, a small distraction from the unease of the previous night. After, I picked up the groceries for my friends, Big Bob, and myself. But by the time I returned to the farm, it had become dark outside. I pulled up outside Big Bob's place and immediately sensed something off. His usual rocking chair sat empty. The front door was left wide open, but there were no lights on inside. Big Bob would never leave his door open, especially after dark. The same uneasy instinct that had gripped me the night before warned me not to go inside. I called out into the black void, stating I'd leave Big Bob's groceries outside by his chair, and he could come get them when he was ready. Bob? Big Bob, you in there? Help me, please. The little girl's voice filled me with terror. She invited me inside, and I politely declined. I knew this was a trick. As I turned around and was ready to walk away, the voice called out to me again. Oh, please don't go. I need your help. I hesitated, torn between the urge to help and my gut instinct. Deep down, I knew it had to be a trap. No little girl would be in Big Bob's house at this hour, hiding in the pitch black. The voice. It was too wrong, too desperate. I felt like it was someone pretending to be a little girl, and they were trying to lure me into the darkness of Big Bob's house. You hang on. I'll be back with help. I promise. Then, from the depths of the shadowed interior, a voice emerged, its tone off. God have mercy on your soul. The words crawled over me like icy fingers. I knew with a sickening certainty that whatever had spoken to me from inside that house wasn't Bob. Panic surged through me and I bolted to my car. I floored the gas, speeding the short distance to my house. Skidding to a stop as close to the front door as I could, I jumped out and sprinted inside, slamming the door behind me and locking it. I rushed through the house, frantically checking every door every window. Just as I finished the last check, a sound stopped me dead in my tracks. A knock at the front door. Not loud or urgent, but soft, ordinary. In the midst of everything, the normalcy of it made me scared. I was afraid to discover what was standing on the other side of my front door. Oh, shit. Shit. I should have taken Shit. Big Bob's warning seriously. Maybe then I wouldn't be in this shitty situation. If I called the police now, it wouldn't matter. By the time they got here, it'd be too late. I crept to a window that faced the front of the house and cautiously peeked out. The angle was wrong. I couldn't see anything. 
but that unsettling mumbling began again. It was coming from just outside the door. Then came another knock, louder this time, more insistent. I spotted a metal bat propped up near the door and snatched it without hesitation, its length giving me just enough distance to strike whatever was waiting on the other side. Why does this have to happen to me? I'm not a bad person. Why? It wasn't much, but it felt like my only lifeline. I raised it, every muscle tense and ready to swing. With my other hand, I gripped the doorknob. I braced myself and in one swift motion yanked the door open, ready to smash the thing's brains in before it could take a single step inside. On the other side of the door, two figures crouched low, hands raised defensively over their heads, bracing themselves for a blow. Whoa, 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 easy, buddy. I froze mid-swing. It took a moment for the scene to sink in. My two friends from college, wide-eyed and terrified, huddled there as if they expected me to strike. It was Harold and Sam, along with their scruffy little chihuahua, Chip. Hey, bro. It's good to see you, man. Man, that's one hell of a way to greet your buddies, said Harold as he slowly straightened up. Inside the house, we gathered around the fireplace, drinks in hand, the flames crackling and hissing, creating a soothing rhythm. We laughed about the misunderstanding at the door. I didn't want to darken the mood by bringing up my parents, so instead, I told them about the strange events from the previous night and what had happened just before they arrived. It was a perfect horror story to share over the fire. Harold found the story amusing, cracking jokes and laughing about it. You know, instead of throwing the phone at you, it could have just sent you a text. <laughs> Sam's demeanor was different. He clutched Chip to his chest like a teddy bear, seeking solace in the small dog's comforting presence. Chip licked his face, a reassuring gesture that seemed to calm his unease. But then, without warning, Chip froze. His ears stood on end, and with a sudden burst of energy, he leaped from Sam's lap, racing towards the front door. He began scratching frantically, alerting us to an unknown presence outside. We hurried towards the windows that faced the front of the house, peering out into the darkness towards the cornfield. That's when we saw it, a silhouette standing at the very edge of the cornfield. The silhouette resembled Big Bob's shape, but something was profoundly wrong. His eyes glowed like the eyes of an animal catching the light at night. They glowed red, like that of a rabbit's eyes, but not as ordinary, far more predatory. His head tilted to the side slightly, as if struggling to stay upright. Whoa, that's a big ass guy. Is that your neighbor, Big Bob? Asked Harold. I told him it looked like Bob, but something felt off. Was he always mentally retarded? Uh, are we gonna be okay? I mean, like, in here? Sam asked as he clutched Chip to his chest again. Don't just stand there. Come inside. Have a cup of tea with us and meet the guys. Harold called out teasing. I cut him off abruptly and told him to stop. Stop! I explained that we shouldn't ever engage with it, remembering the warning Bob had given me. Was it already too late? Or had we already fucked him? In a desperate attempt to reassure myself as much as my friends, I said that we should be fine if we stay inside for the night, and he, or whatever it is, will be gone by morning. We continued to watch the figure as it stood stiff and motionless. Its gaze fixed on us with a chilling intensity. Slowly, it began to retreat, backing away into the oppressive darkness between the tall corn stalks, its silhouette merging with the shadows as it disappeared from view. A while after we settled in for the night, I offered Sam my parents' bedroom, but without trying to be rude, he respectfully declined. He told me he didn't feel comfortable sleeping in their room out of respect. Instead, he chose my old bedroom with Chip curled up at the end of his bed.
Harold, without a second thought, accepted the offer to take my parents' room. I envied his carefree attitude. I curled up on the sofa, trying to get comfortable, but sleep wouldn't come. My mind raced, piecing together the unsettling events that happened in this room. Was the person Harold called a retarded version of Big Bob somehow linked to my parents' deaths? Just as I began to drift off, a faint noise snapped me awake. The front doorknob was rattling. I froze as slow, deliberate footsteps moved from the door to the window. I pretended to be asleep, keeping one eye barely open. Then I saw him, Big Bob, or something that looked like him. His head was grotesquely oversized, eyes glowing red, arms unnaturally long. He dragged his crooked nails across the window, then leaned in and fogged the glass with his breath. With one twisted finger, he began tracing something in the condensation. When he stepped back, I could see what he'd written. I know you're awake. Terrified, I bolted upright, rushing to lock the doors and windows. As I finished, I heard footsteps on the stairs. Harold appeared, rubbing his eyes clueless. Still half asleep, he mumbled, Oh, what's all the noise about, buddy? Before I could answer, Sam came down, holding Chip. He set the little dog down, eyeing me with concern. I told them everything. I explained what I'd seen at the window. The grotesque, twisted figure that looked like Big Bob, the haunting message it had left on the glass. As I was speaking, my dad's phone suddenly lit up with the familiar chime of a new message. I'd completely forgotten about it. I moved over and picked it up, the screen demanding a pin. On the first try, I got it right. My mother's birthday. I browsed through the phone while Harold and Sam spoke to each other. Determined to find clues, I delved into the phone's messages. Scrolling through, I stumbled upon something strange. A text from Bob, asking if my dad was absolutely sure that it hadn't escaped from the basement. A chill crawled up my spine. What could possibly have escaped from the basement? My thoughts were suddenly interrupted. The front door creaked open. My blood turned cold. I stared at Harold, confused and panicked. Why the hell did you open the door? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Harold gave me a puzzled look, still rubbing his eyes. Uh, because the dog needs to go take a piss? He said casually. When you gotta go, you gotta go, right? Are you effing stupid? Did you not just hear what he said? Is something out there and you just let the dog go out the load? What? That there's a retarded giant outside. Big deal. Sam hurried out the front door, panic driving his every step. Harold and I followed close behind. Outside, it was dark. The air was thick with fog, making it impossible to see more than a few feet ahead. The usual hum of buzzing insects filled the night, but there was no sign of Chip. Chip was gone. Sam paced back and forth at the edge of the porch, his voice trembling as he called out for Chip, his desperation growing with each unanswered Where shout. Are you, boy? His panic was palpable. Harold, who had been carefree and joking moments before, seemed burdened with guilt. His eyes darted to Sam, regret etched on his face. Trying to make up for it, he ventured closest to the cornfield, standing at the line where the tall stalks began, calling for Chip. I stayed near the house, peering around its edges, but I couldn't bring myself to step into the pitch-black shadows behind it, where the forest was. The thought of wandering into that darkness was too much. Knowing my luck, I'd be the one to get snatched up first. The easiest prey, just like Big Bob had warned me. Just as I was about to give up hope, a bark echoed from the depths of the cornfield. Chip. It was Chip, or was it? Without a moment's hesitation, Harold dashed into the cornfield, his figure swallowed by the dense stalks. I tried to call out to stop him, stop! but within seconds, Harold was gone. Sam and I exchanged a glance. 
And then we plunged into the cornfield after him and Chip. My mind screamed that this was a reckless decision, but there was no turning back now. The cornstalks reduced my vision. Visibility was reduced to mere inches, and before long, we were completely separated. A cold realization settled over me. I was sure this was a trap. The inhuman entity that lurked in these fields had orchestrated our separation by pretending to be Chip, and its plan had worked. Suddenly, that foul stench hit me again. Panic surged through me, and despite knowing it would reveal my position, I called out for the others. Harold! Sam! I'm... I'm fucking lost. I'm lost, man. I made the decision to move towards Harold's voice. My heart pounded as I hurried through the dark field, straining to hear any sign of my friends or the lurking presence hunting us. Then, Harold's voice came closer, filled with a glimmer of hope. I found a way out. I could see your neighbor's house. I think I saw Chip go inside. I couldn't afford to call back and risk giving away my position. Instead, I quickened my pace. Eventually, a flicker of relief washed over me as I stumbled upon an exit from the cornfield. I could see Big Bob's house, but there was no sign of Harold. I moved stealthily across the grass toward the house, my senses on high alert. As I drew closer, the front door of Bob's house stood wide open, a gaping void of pitch black darkness within. With every instinct screaming at me to turn back, I climbed the creaking steps of the front porch. Each step felt like a violation of my survival instincts. I had to press on. Harold might be an idiot, but he was still my friend, and he needed help. I approached the darkened doorway and went inside. The layout of the house was familiar, mirroring my parents' home, so I navigated the interior with confidence, despite the darkness. A few steps in, the rotting stench returned. I could hear an unsettling noise, a blend of slurping and sucking, like something ravenously eating. Compelled, I crept toward the sound, which seemed to be coming from the living room. My heart raced as I peeked around the corner, and what I saw nearly shattered my sanity. It was the most disturbing shit I had ever seen. A monstrous creature had Harold pinned against the wall. The beast's massive clawed hands gripped Harold's shoulders, lifting him off the ground. Harold's legs dangled helplessly, and the creature's gaping mouth had Harold's entire head inside. It was eating Harold. The creature's glowing eyes locked onto me momentarily, but it seemed uninterested, preoccupied with its feast. It was as if the act of eating Harold was so satisfying that it couldn't be bothered with me. A surge of terror paralyzed me, but then survival instinct took over. My body moved on its own. I ran as fast as I could, racing back towards my own house, driven by the primal need to escape. I burst through the door of my parents' house, heart hammering in my chest, frantically searching for my car keys. My hands fumbled through drawers, my mind clouded with panic. Where the hell were they? A movement outside the window caught my eye, and when I looked up, I was fucking terrified. A tall, emaciated, pale figure was slowly approaching the house. My stomach churned when I realized what it was wearing. Harold's skin draped over its face like an ill-fitting mask. The creature's steps were disturbingly joyful as it skipped toward my house. I didn't have time to find the keys. Panic set in, and my thoughts spiraled, searching for any possible escape. Then suddenly, it hit me. The basement. Without another thought, I sprinted toward it, knowing it might be the only chance I had left. I ran down the stairs toward the door, it had a series of heavy latches and locks, all oddly unlocked. I slowly eased the door open, making as little noise as possible, and stepped into the darkness. Closing the door behind me, I fumbled for my dad's phone, using its weak glow to light the narrow wooden stairs descending into the underground. The deeper I crept into the basement, the more the stench hit me, the place stunk of shit. At the bottom, the floor was nothing but cold dirt, uneven and damp beneath my feet. 
As I moved cautiously through the shadows, the phone's beam flickered across the walls, revealing deep, jagged scratches, as if something had been trapped down here, clawing desperately to escape. I knelt down to examine the marks, and that's when I tripped, stumbling over something cold and metallic. Chains. Heavy, rusted chains, lying abandoned on the dirt floor. It all clicked into place. The scratches, the chains, the cryptic message from Big Bob. My parents had been keeping something down here, something they had desperately tried to contain. I stood up, my hands trembling as I continued to investigate my surroundings. I wish I hadn't. In the far corner of the basement, my light flickered across something awful. I found Sam. Well, what was left of him. His skin was pinned to the wall, stretched out like a twisted suit. I nearly vomited right then and there. But it only got worse. Next to Sam's skin was another. Big Bob. His flesh, too, was pinned up like a sick trophy, as if this thing had kept them as souvenirs. My shaking hand moved the light past their remains. And that's when my world shattered. I saw them. The skins of my mom and dad, hanging lifelessly beside each other. Their eyes missing and their skin dried out like beef jerky. Every unanswered question crashed down on me at once. The creature had been here all along, hunting, tormenting, and finally skinning them. My parents had died in this very place, and now I stood in its lair. Tears blurred my vision, rolling uncontrollably down my face. That's when I heard it. The basement door creaked open. Footsteps. Slow. Deliberate. It was coming for me, descending the stairs, taking its time. I was trapped. My fate sealed, twisted into the same end as my friends and parents. Soon, I would be torn apart, my skin flayed from muscle, a grotesque shell for this skin walker. <laughs>